Testing, one, two, three, right. Talking to Richie Blackmore, lead guitarist of Blackmore's Rainbow. No, Rainbow. Rainbow, that's better. How have you enjoyed the Australian tour so far, Richie? Uh, well, we haven't started yet. We're about to start tomorrow, our first and last date in Melbourne. We did the biggest date tonight, the three of us, um, Jimmy Bain on bass and somebody on drums, a friend of mine on guitar, and I play guitar. Uh, the big one's over, and tomorrow we just have, I believe, is it called the Festival Hall that we play? That's right. Right. Um, we we'll play there tomorrow. We've already played there once, actually, yeah, being serious for a second. And um, obviously I'm going to say that the tour went very well. I could be lying, but in this instance I don't think I am. So um, we're very pleased with Australia. I quite like Australia. Once the uh, the initial stages of jet lag uh, are gone, because it's so far mm -hmm. to come, it's 22 hours, and that was coming from Los Angeles. And uh, it was still so, it takes it out of you, it makes you very lethargic. Also, we're having a little bit of problem with the polarity system because we're near the South Pole, believe it or not, which is completely opposite to Norman, the Northern uh, Hemisphere, because uh, up there you have a different pull in gravity, so you get different polarity and different sounds. But uh, apart from that, the, the audiences have been fantastic. Can we um, do a history of yourself, going no. back right to the beginning? Rather not. Okay. Uh, in what way? Um, well, going back to... Um, okay. When, say, when did you get your first guitar? Uh, I first picked up a guitar at 11 years old, and uh, father brought that for me. I went to lessons, classical lessons, for... Uh, about two years, then I went on to um, uh, studying under Jimmy Sullivan, who's a guitarist who used to play with Tom Jones, a very good friend of mine, brilliant guitarist, not recognized very much. And um, after about four years of that, I uh, was self-taught. Uh, That's why it uh, accounts for the, uh, the bad way that I play at the moment. But, uh, I'm working on it after 20 years. When did you actually play in your first band? first band, I think, was when I was at school. We had a, a school band which had uh, about 25 guitarists, one drummer who had a snare drum, and a bass player who wasn't plugged in. So you can imagine the sound. But it went down well at school. Yeah. Well, what about after that? What was your first major band? My first major band would be, uh, I suppose, Screaming a Lot Such and Savages. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot of uh, professionalism from him. He taught me how to leap about and act like a clown without being laughed at, basically, which is what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I think it's all part of the music. Our music is nervous aggression, aggression type of music, which incorporates kind of a very heavy kind of side of uh, effects, kind of pulverizing people into the ground, basically. But without actually, we, we still use dynamics, but. Um, it's shock tactics, not to the extent that somebody like Kiss would be at. Uh, that's shock tactics as far as the way they're made up. How nice. do you feel about Kiss musically? I've never really listened to them, so I don't know. Um, do you feel um, you've been ripped off at any stage of your career by managers or um, promoters? No, never, because I've always had a very good uh, accountant. He's like a father to me. He always looks like he's a very very uh, astute businessman, and he knows. There was a few times when uh, it looked doubtful, but um, we have certain people that back us that um, know how to deal with things like that. Mm -hmm. Whether it be in a in a gentleman's agreement or physical violence, they know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't get messed around. In the beginning, before I joined, for instance, Deep Purple, which was a long time ago, Ten years ago, I used to find that I was turning up to clubs in Germany and they would take the passport and say, well, uh, you, you have to play here for a month, which was fair enough. We'd be paid a certain amount every week, but we never got that money because um, they would always say we played too loud, too long, or we started late. There was always some excuse. This is the... The uh, hard early days. Yeah, the, the German promoters, and we used to sleep in vans and shack up with any girls that had a bed, really. <laughs> But uh, it makes you hard. It's like the army. Mm. <laughs> Moving on to Rainbow, um, when did you first seriously think of leaving Deep Purple 
Uh, and was it hard to leave? No, it wasn't hard to leave at all. I'd had enough of all the little aggravations that come about after knowing people for eight years. And um, managerial pressure was kind of hard. Uh, I, I did enough with Deep Purple I thought was uh, valid. I thought it was time to, to move on. I didn't actually consider forming another band. I just wanted to leave at the time. I was tired of doing the same old thing. Ronnie came along, Ronnie James Dio, the singer. We got together and uh, we made a song. Was which that Black Sheep and That's family? right, yeah. Uh, and um, we recorded that, recorded the B-side, then consequently made an LP. Then, uh, at which time I thought I should leave because I, had, uh, I was more excited whilst making that record than I had been to making Stormbringer. Mm -hmm. You were actually people. playing in two bands at the time? Or uh, you were I was, with yes. I was recording with, with Rainbow and playing with Purple. We were doing Melbourne, I think, was one of the gigs that we Sunbury. did. I believe so. When was that? February? Uh, January. Uh, January 75. Yeah, January I was writing songs with Ronnie. Mm -hmm. um, well, how did, how did Rainbow actually first come into existence? How did you meet the other guys? Um, Jimmy comes from Scotland, and I met him through a friend of mine. Tony Carey is an Indian from Connecticut uh, in America and uh, Cozy used to play with Jeff Beck who I know quite well and mm -hmm. I'd seen him perform and I was quite impressed by Cozy's playing. Mm -hmm. Jeff has moved on to a, f a kind of jazzy thing which Cozy's not into so much playing wise he is listening wise but and uh, I thought he was a very good drummer very aggressive very mean mm -hmm. and uh, he was just right for the band. Great that's, person. that's the current band Mm -hmm. um, the first band had a different lineup. Can That's you right, tell us a bit about that? The first band was just a session band that was more or less Elf. That was Ronnie's band. I said, who can we, who should we employ to do these songs? And he just said, why not use our band, my band, Elf? I said, okay, why not? And we used them, but it was just for the recording. Mm -hmm. After that, when it took off the record and we thought seriously about making up uh, a group, we had to consider professionals. Not, not that they weren't professionals, but people that would have personalities and project on stage. Did you actually did you actually tour with the first band? No, never. Uh -huh. um, well, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the tracks on the first album? Um, mm. For instance, the first track, the opening track, and the single, Man on the Silver Mountain. How did that come about? Man on the Silver Mountain was written with Sherpa Tenzing in mind uh, when he climbed Mount Everest. It's all about a man who climbs Mount Everest. and. Uh, it's a silver mountain, he gets to the top and he finds that uh, he's found the silver, which uh, one can never express the feeling of situation according to the problem when one's put on top of a mountain and there's no silver. Uh, but he had actually found silver, and it is kind of in retrospect, it's kind of a vague, abstract uh, way of saying that life in its barest form would be seen from a, a top of a mountain. And this is why we wrote the song, because Ronnie was very much into that, and which in finding the, the, the silver, he saw the rainbow. This is why the rainbow is, is involved too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Man of Silver Mountain was written around uh, Capri's chocolate bars, basically. Um, I noticed with Stormbringer and the first Rainbow album, you seemed as though you were going through a more soft and melodic phase. Yes. Uh, for instance, Soldier of Fortune, Temple mm -hmm. of the King, yeah. and Catch the Rainbow. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about this stage? And uh... Yes, it was just a, a normal stage that everybody goes through. I like extremes. My extremes in music are rock, progressive rock to medieval baroque music, which I love. I listen to the baroque music, medieval modes and progressions and pageantry music, um, but I play rock and roll. Mm -hmm. I like the extremes. I don't like the in-betweens like jazz and soul, funk. Mm -hmm. doesn't interest me, doesn't move me, doesn't grab me mm -hmm. at all. Do you think that this funk and disco revolution um, is going to inhibit heavy rock bands in the future? It seems to be sort of no, taking over in popularity. Uh, well, people have been saying that for the last four years. It's certainly very popular, but it's only popular to people that are tone deaf and just want to bash their feet up and down in discotheque. But when it all boils down to it, uh, if you put them in a room and say, right, listen to this or this, I think they will go for melodic music rather than just a thumping drum beat. Mm. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you actually wrote Catch the Rainbow? Uh, Catch the Rainbow was written around a kind of progression which was mentioned earlier, Little Wing, mm. by Jimi Hendrix. It was, had that sort of vein running through it, but it wasn't modelled on that, but it had that 
it must have been subconscious at the time which mm -hmm. came out this is um, one of your feature songs on stage yeah i like playing it but it's very very quiet it's a, it's, a, it's a very emotional personal song that you have to feel really good to play it otherwise you can make yourself feel very bad you can be very embarrassing um if you don't play it very well because it's there's no noise and heavy metal mm. uh, banging going on to cover up it's a very very soft song S simple um, Temple of the King was another acoustic track uh, mm. similar in vain just to uh, Soldier of Fortune yeah, Temple of the King was taken from a yoga program I used to watch uh, in Los Angeles uh, I don't do yoga but I was just watching it it was very relaxing and uh, one of the themes to the the show was very similar to Temple of the King, the riff, and I just had the riff and the progression. I gave it to Ronnie and he put the words to it, mm -hmm. which is what we usually do, but not always. Did you actually write the uh, um, Black Sheep of the Family? Did, was that no. your idea? No, it was written by some guy called Steve something or other. He used, he's not a well-known writer. It's just a song I like very much. And uh, I did it with Ronnie because Purple didn't particularly want to record it. They like to record their own songs, whether it be because they like to be included on writing royalties, I'm not sure. But I like the song very much. I just wanted to record a single, Black Sheep of the Family, which it, we did, and I, I liked was it, it very much. Was it put out as a single? No, because we had so many other better songs after that. Mm -hmm. It was really a one-of, which turned into an LP. Mm. Um, you've got a classic type song on that first album. 16th century green sleeves mm. um, and you have the words on the cover mm. can you tell us about it, a bit about this track um, it's uh, it's a written I so I live near Windsor Castle and I'm very much into the Renaissance period yeah. and uh, it's it's written with Henry the eighth in mind about being locked up in a castle and blah 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 and, and green sleeves is the theme because Greensleeves being probably my favourite tune ever written, which was written 500 years ago by Henry VIII, of which not many people believe, but it was true. Or it was written by one of his court jesters and his head was cut off and he took a writing royalties, but it came from that that court, that the people of Henry VIII, and they put it down to Henry VIII because he was a very accomplished musician. And... Um, it all follows that uh, I believe also in reincarnation. I'm into psychic research, and I feel very at home uh, when I'm in that kind of era or kind of relaxing playing that music. Uh, to me, it's it's very close. You but, recorded. Um, it was hard rock incorporating this progression of which they call modes. In those days, it was all the white notes on the piano. Eight white notes on the piano would be a mode, or six notes, depending on what period of time. No sharps or flats. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting song you recorded on the first album was the old Yardbird song, yeah. uh, Still I'm Sad. You made this into an instrumental. That's right, because um, I liked the song and I used to fiddle around with it on my tape recorder at home. And um, I, I always loved the song. It, it was a 13th century, 14th century Gregorian chant that the monks used to sing. And. Um, I was very inspired by that. I'm not too much into Gregorian chants, Ambrosian chants, things like that, but uh, they do have their place late at night when I'm going to bed. Freaks a lot of people out because it sounds like ghostly church music or something, and they mm. don't, don't quite understand that. The notes being, again, a certain... They don't, uh, they don't uh, deviate from the set scale mm -hmm. of, like, motets and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, did you meet any of the guys in the Yardbirds? Mm. Jeff Beck or Eric Clapton oh, yeah, or Jimmy Jeff Page? Very well. Eric, I don't know quite so well, but I know 